Welcome to In the Envelope, a podcast from Backstage, the number one resource for actors and talent seekers. I am your host, Jack Smart, awards editor at Backstage, and I'm here to guide you through every aspect of the entertainment industry with the help of some of your favorite stars. These intimate, inspirational conversations with today's most award-worthy film, television, and theater artists provide you, dear listener, advice on how to live the creative life, personal stories of success and failure alike, and maybe, just maybe, a tantalizing glimpse in the envelope. You're never going to lose anything by trying. So dare greatly, get in there, have fun, enjoy yourself. I would come in, if I really didn't feel something, I would just do a weird take on it and just go, here's a weird take. Welcome listeners to another episode of In the Envelope. I would say a very special episode of In the Envelope. Given the nature of today's guest and today's other guest, who is friend of the podcast, godmother, fairy godmother of the podcast, Tooth Fairy, what did we call you? I think fairy godmother was what we said. Uh, Casey Howe, how are you? Hi. Hi, Jack. Thank you for having me back. This is, I, this is a very, I'm really excited about today's episode. Um, how are you doing? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. All is good. We are in the midst of um, what we fondly refer, refer to as awards season, as you well know, um, and our listeners know. So we are, yeah, we're coming up on the SAG Awards and we're coming up on gearing up for the last stretch of Oscars. So it's very, mm-hmm. very exciting time. I always get um, a little bit of, for some reason, like butterflies this time of year for everybody and just the excitement yes. that everybody must be feeling and... Um, you know, post nominations, but pre, yes. you know, announcement of of the winners, and you know, just I always kind of get this um, this anticipation, excitement going. So, yeah, that's the world I'm living in right now. I'm like, oh, who's what's going to happen? I agree. I mean, it's such a fun time of year, and I really love this list of contenders this year. And on it is today's guest, Reese Witherspoon, who. Yay! I feel like needs no introduction. Well, first of all, she is nominated for two SAG Awards this year for her work on Apple's The Morning Show and is, of course, an Oscar winner herself. But so can I put you on the spot, Casey, and just have you introduce our esteemed guest? I I love Reese. Um, I love, I think she's a wonderful person. And then I also Mm. think that her work is just phenomenal. So, you know, I always get excited whenever she participates in things with us just because um, Mm. she's so much fun and she's just a ball of joy and light. And I just think that's so wonderful. And, um, you know, and I think that she's not always a typical interview for us, maybe because she's not as classically trained or maybe she doesn't get Ah. a lot of the dramatic roles or something like that. But, you know, I don't want to say just recently, but, you know, certainly when when you and I started fangirling together um, during during the inception of this podcast about uh-huh. her and Big Little Lies and um, all yes. of that, that, you know, I think um, those type of performances, <laughs> I always love to see someone who starts off in more of a comedic role or something that they can really get pigeonholed in and oh, then they sure. break out of it. And I just love to see that. It's so much fun to see the range of these actors and what they can do. So I'm just, I'm thrilled about your interview and totally. just love, love, love Reese. I just think she's wonderful and and a great addition to the podcast interviews. Totally. And, and she's a milestone. And she's a milestone. She's a milestone. Tell us, Jack. I have it on the notes here. Reese Witherspoon is this podcast's 200th guest. Yay! Which is, uh, pre- you know, by my own count. Like, I, this is by no means an official. <laughs> I've just gone through and been keeping track of that. We'll see. We'll <laughs> see if, uh, if Sam Sherlock ats us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's so, it's, this is why I asked you here today, because it's true that the part of the context of this Reese Witherspoon in, the episode that's so exciting is that when you and I came up with the proof of concept for this for this very podcast. I mean, the, it was it was an opportunity to like, you know, do what bo- backstage does best in another medium, audio. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And to, we we executed the perf- the proof of concept right away. This thing <laughs> of like 
actors and creators who might be using backstage, you know, this is a chance for them to get educated and get inspired and hear the stories of, of these amazing, successful actors. And when Claire Danes walked over from her apartment yes! to join me in the oh studio, right then we knew, like, this was this was real. But that was in 2017, which was at the height mm-hmm. of Big Little Lies Season 1 mania. Yes. And it was all you and I talked about. It was all the whole backstage backstage team <laughs> talked about, truly. And I think there were there was even something of like, well, maybe one day we'll get Reese Witherspoon or Nicole Kidman. Yeah, or, yeah. And here we are. And here we are. I know. And, and by the way. And spoiler alert. Um, just because they are such a pair and we couldn't do one without the other. It's a total coincidence. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this week, you will be hearing from the glorious Reese Witherspoon. And then next week, also programming note, everyone, the episode is going to release early next yes. week. Good call. To accommodate a little, um, to com- accommodate really the end of SAG voting. But... Nicole Kidman will be Jack. Oh my God. Episode next week. So you have two amazing episodes back to back coming your way. It's true. So make sure to subscribe so you don't miss when they drop. It's like the biggest week ever for the podcast. And it really is a total coincidence that they both are, of course, they're both in this award season, but they're, yeah, they were booked back to back and two really terrific interviews. Yeah. At both the producer stars of Big Little Lies. I mean, both women, trailblazing yeah. women in the industry and both had similar things to 100%. say hundred percent. I mean, I love, you know, I also love to see, and I'm seeing this more, and I do think that that Reese in particular was quite a trail trailblazer with it. And it's really spreading. I love to see when the show is produced by one of their oh, lead yeah. actresses. Yes. And it's been going on, I think, a lot in the actor field where they get a producing credit. And now these women are saying, no, we need one too. And here's what we're going to do. And here's how we're going to control this. So I think Reese, I think Nicole certainly, you know, oh, Jennifer yeah. Aniston does a lot of that, that type of no, 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 you know, we're, we're in this game too. And and yeah. we're going to, you know, we're going to take our place. So I just love to see that. I think that these production companies that are led and mm-hmm. and really run and set up by by these wonderfully, you know, talented and powerful women is just something that is amazing to see for the industry. So the stars really aligned <laughs> on this one. It's very exciting. Um, thank you for like being nostalgic and retrospective oh. and taking us down memory lane, Casey. It's always just fun to, I don't know, look back. This does feel like an important milestone. And the fact that it's Reese freaking Witherspoon is insane. <laughs> I know. I know. I'm so excited and I cannot wait to listen to the interview. For your awards consideration, Succession, the HBO original series nominated for five SAG awards, including outstanding performance by an ensemble and a drama series. Season 3 finds Waystar Roy Co. CEO Logan Roy in a perilous position, scrambling to secure familial, political, and financial alliances as tensions rise and a bitter corporate battle threatens to turn into a family civil war. Don't miss what critics call extraordinary performances from the finest drama ensemble on television. Succession is now streaming on HBO Max. One of Hollywood's most prolific artist-activists working today, Reese Witherspoon, has created unforgettable characters on screen and off screen with her award-winning media company, Hello Sunshine. The Emmy and Academy Award winner broke out with Cruel Intentions and Election, starring in Legally Blonde, Walk the Line, Wild, and on TV, Big Little Lies, Little Fires Everywhere, and Apple's The Morning Show, where her performance is now nominated for two SAG Awards. Here is the delightful Reese Witherspoon. Reese Witherspoon, hi, how are you? Hi, Jack. How's it going? It's going really well. I'm such a big fan. I'm so excited to talk to you about all things acting. I've been listening to the podcast. You do such a lovely job. Oh, my gosh. Really? Yeah. I think it's, you know, it's... It's great. I mean, it's something as a young actor, I would have just loved to hear these perspectives. That's so amazing to hear. Um, I am starting this interview off by being speechless. Um, (laughs) You're doing a good job, Jack. (laughs) No, now I have stage fright. 200 interviews in for this podcast, and now I'm like, I can't do it. I can't do it. (laughs) I'm going to ask you for all of your 
crafty secrets as well as uh, early career <laughs> advice. But so early career, take me back to the beginning. I mean, why why acting is something we always ask. I know that you left school to act and did not necessarily have formal acting training. So you learned on the job. Yeah. Well, I started when I was 14 years old. Um, actually, let me back up. I started when I was seven. <laughs> My, I grew up in Nashville, Tennessee, and my friend, um, her grandmother had a flower shop, and they wanted all the little kids in the neighborhood to come over and be in the commercial, and something happened. I remember sitting at a little table, and I was they put me on phone books because I was so short and tiny, <sighs> and I went home and told my mother, I'm going to be an actor. Oh, cool. And she said, what? I said, I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to be an actor. And so she, my mother this just, I can't say enough nice stuff about my mother supporting my dreams. She took me down to local acting classes. They didn't have any for kids. So she enrolled me in the local community college acting class for adults. Amazing. I I finished that. I did the comedy class. I did their acting for commercial class. And I started booking a lot of commercials by the time I was 12. And then when I was 14, a local casting call came through Nashville looking for a Southern girl who was 14. And I ended up getting my first starring role in a movie called Man in the Moon, which was directed by um, Robert Mulligan, who directed To Kill a Mockingbird. Mm-hmm. And so before we ever started shooting that film, he took the three leads who we were all young and inexperienced mm. and from the middle of the country. And he taught us how to act on film for two gotcha. weeks. Oh, for two weeks. Two weeks. Weeks all of the of like rehearsal. technical the steps all the tips yeah all of it this is a mark yeah. this is a camera angle this you're gonna do it again you're gonna do it again no you're being self conscious do it again mm. do it again yeah learn to run differently move your arms differently take up space use when the camera's close to you your reactions are very small when the camera is far away you can have bigger reactions and use your hands wow it was incredible. <laughs> These are I the mean, skills that most actors, yeah, don't get at their first I didn't, gig. Yeah, you you don't realize because a lot of people book a job and no one's kind to them. No one is gracious or says, you know, this is how you prepare or this is how you behave. It's really um, a rude awakening. So I try <laughs> to be as loving and kind and helpful to new actors when they're on set because it's really... It's really like jumping two feet into a cold pool. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually always interesting to ask about the, the first day on set and the advice for, for first day on set. So, of course, process, techniques. If you didn't have the formal training, if, if, you're, if you were thrown two feet into the, the cold pool, what would you say your techniques are? Or are there things that you do every time? Oh, my gosh. That's, <laughs> that's what's really hard. It's hard for me to describe it because I've kind of taped together with duct tape and (laughs) I don't know, things have worked and other things haven't worked. So my strategy for each role, the way I prepare for everything is kind of all over the place. And it's deeply personal for me. So sometimes I have a hard time explaining to directors what I do, but it's a deep, deep understanding of where the character comes from what their upbringing was, who loved them, who didn't love them, you know, how do they walk through the world? Do they diminish themselves? Do they take up space? And it's so much of it comes from knowing people and watching people. I I have to say, like, every actor you know is probably watching you (laughs) and you don't (laughs) even know it. So many of my performances have been based on my friends and I've never ever told them. Oh, I love that. Um, Because you pick pieces of human behavior that really work for each character. And like when I was doing Legally Blonde, I had this really great process where I just went to Beverly Hills and I went to a fancy department store and I watched women try on shoes and the joy that it would bring them to have these new shoes. And then I watched how they walked and how those shoes changed their body and how they took smaller steps. But they were very precise, almost like a little deer. And I also had um, acrylic nails in Legally Blonde. You mm-hmm. hold your hands completely differently when you have acrylic nails. Um, women speak with their hands more. They they tap things. They um, 
again, it's almost like you have an elegant way of composing sentences and using your gestures um, because you want people to notice your nails. Oh. So just like that, that kind of stuff. I also got to go to a sorority and watch sorority girls and how they behave and what are the female dynamics that when lots of women live in a group, mm-hmm. it's almost like being an anthropologist sometimes. Yes. yes. You are studying contemporary behavior and how people interact and then applying it to character. Totally. I mean, Legally, Legally Blonde is a documentary, so. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, not exactly, but it is very, <laughs> I mean, for, there's a reason that it has stood the test of time. And, yes. you know, I always, even when I was a very young person, I loved movies. I watched movies obsessively. I must have watched Holly Hunter in broadcast news maybe <sighs> 37 times yeah. or Diane Weist in Bullets Over Broadway over and over and over again. I just... I love actors and I love performance. Um, Jenna Rollins, I just Mm. is mesmerizing. Laura Dern was somebody who I grew up watching a lot Mm. and just being fascinated by her choices and her ferocity and her clearness um, and her directness. Nicole in in Moulin Mm. Rouge was Mm. just a, such an inspiration and a revelation of vulnerability, but also um, having a duality about herself that was hidden, like having his shadow self. Um, mm. So I, I just, I grew up being a fan and the fandom, I think also, I want to just say too, I didn't just watch fancy stuff. I probably watched seven hours of sitcoms every single day of my childhood. Sure. I loved sitcoms. And that's part of the training too. Yeah. It is part of the training and yeah. watching other people work and learning what's funny. That's, I will say, you're either funny or you're not funny. <laughs> I discovered that. It's hard to figure it out. Love that. But people who are funny are just probably raised by funny people. <laughs> and you're just funny. Yeah. I so will you're... say, I too, I discovered later in life that my, and I didn't know this, but my uncle, who I never met, who had passed away, was a Broadway actor. So I thought, oh. I didn't know that. So my, my mom's a nurse and my dad's a doctor. And they could not figure out why I wanted to do this from such a young age. I do think there is something interesting, genetic, <laughs> sure, a performance gene or something. Yeah, that either you have it or you don't. But it's like either you have it or you don't for for passion, for the passion yeah. for the storytelling. And I love this idea of you 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 observe real people, but you're also observing these performances, and certainly not copying performances, but. Did you know that the acting techniques that these actresses you admired were using? And did that kind of inform some of your processes? I mean, I was so siloed in Nashville. I had nothing but books. So I would just read books about Stanislavski or, Mm. you know, The Method or um, Strasbourg. But I didn't really, I didn't practice the concepts because I didn't really know. I just didn't know. And then I started so young that I got so much practical experience I had this movie that I did when I was 19. I'd never done really comedies, but I did this movie when I was 19 called Freeway. And I was just so committed to the character. I knew where she was from and she had a very thick country accent and she'd grown up at a, you know, on a underserved part of her community and she was just scrappy and tough and a survivor. And I just knew it. And I was so serious about it when we were making the movie. And then I showed up at Sundance thinking I just delivered this incredible dramatic performance and everyone in the audience started laughing. And I was like, why are they laughing? This is very serious. I, this girl is, I know this girl, she's my friend. Mm. And I thought, oh, that was my first lesson. And that's what comedy is. That's the Comedy is just deep commitment to character never flinching, always staying in it, and having no awareness of self. And having no awareness. Interesting. Yeah. No, comedy is characters just have no awareness of how people see them. The characters do not think they're funny. They think they're serious. Absolutely. I I have a rule. You don't laugh at your own jokes in comedies. It's the audience's job to laugh at you. Okay. And if they think it's funny, great. If they don't, that's okay too. Just commit. It's the commitment. Yeah. 
And I mean, you've mentioned this idea of the background of the character and I, can we ask about backstory? I mean, you're such yeah. a reader. You're of course such a reader to this day. So I imagine yeah. that that has something to do with it where you almost want a novel's worth of information about a character. Right. Well, I read a lot as a kid. Writers are my rock stars. I just yeah. have always been um, such a voracious reader. And I had this incredible high school teacher named Mar Margaret Rankle. And um, she's now a writer for the New York Times and a novelist. And she just does incredible. She's an essayist. And she's, um, but she taught me about comparative literature and about every character. You've basically seen them before, okay. but in a different context. So what you you can pull out of character, like how could you compare that character to Atticus Finch or or anyone from contemporary fiction? You know, is that a character from a Nick Hornby novel? Like how have you seen that person before and what was that journey they were in in a different situation? And you just start to see themes that really resonate with with humanity, right? They always say there's only, what, eight or 12 different stories. And it feels that way. I feel like there's only eight or 12 different movies too. <laughs> <laughs> sure. And I sort of think that's helpful for actors to hear because then it's not your, it's not like you're starting from complete scratch. No, and there's so many reference points that you can, if you're well-read, it's, I mean, first of all, it's such a privilege to be well-read. Um, mm -hmm. And I know it's time consuming, but it helps build your fantasy life to push the boundaries of what you think is possible. Think expansively. I always say, think about scarcity. Oh, no, think about abundance, not scarcity, right? Oh, so uh -huh. everything is infinite if you're a reader. You you could live a million different lives, but if you don't read, you only live one life. Hmm. Yeah, don't limit yourself, yeah. Yeah. So where does, this, where does that character construction process then factor in your own personal experiences? Like how often are you, speaking of Strasbourg, how often are you using memory or personal emotions, maybe even to a therapeutic or unsafe <laughs> extent? Because yeah. that can happen too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, definitely a lot of personal memories, a lot of um, painful pulling at things that have happened in my life, um, and sometimes to, to my own detriment, definitely. And I, you know, I only... I read um, a book by, oh gosh, what's her name? Anyway, she wrote a beautiful book about being an actor. Just this idea that actors, your body doesn't know that you're not having a real feeling, right? Mm -hmm. If you're doing it right, you're having the real feeling. And you can put yourself through, um, you know, an entire day, 12 hours worth of filming of something traumatic, something exhausting, something yeah. emotionally triggering. And, and it's really, really important. I used to not have any process of letting go or being kind to myself afterwards. Gotcha. And parts, parts would haunt me. Like June Carter Cash haunted me for three really? months. Yeah. Oh, it, it haunted me. I couldn't hear Johnny Cash songs if, if it came on the radio and I was at some place, I'd have to leave. She would come to me in my dreams. It was it was intense. It was yeah. intense. Wow. That's always interesting to ask about the emotion. And yeah, like you've had to learn maybe the hard way that sometimes you got to get rid of or somehow ritualistically part ways with a character. Do you think of these characters mm -hmm. that you mentioned that they were a friend, that a character was yeah. a friend? Yeah. You're not talking about them in the first person, maybe? You're not thinking about them as you? No, but like recently, um, Tracy Flick has come back in my life and that Tom Parada has written a novel that's a follow-up about Tracy Flick. And it's yes. coming out this summer and he was so lovely and gracious to let me read it. Really? And Okay. But I was scared to open the pages. And yeah. it makes me want to cry right now because I think she's my friend. I wanted I was I was worried about what happened to her. And ah. is she okay? Wow. And I, I'm like going to cry, but um, I feel that close to her. Yeah. You know? But it's also, that's a character that he's created, but it's also someone you've created. So your take on the character, it must be interesting to then read the book that might, I don't know, you're learning more about this person that you also helped. 
make real. Yeah, <laughs> and he and I had a lovely discussion about it, and he he generated that character, but I made her live, you know. And so we yeah. we mutually appreciate who she is in this world, and um, and also she became a par like sometimes a parody um, of female ambition, yeah. um, a female mm. political ambition. And also, there recently after Me Too, there's been articles written about people watching the film again and saying, "Oh, this was a young girl who was groomed by her teacher." Hmm. And when I watched it before, I thought she was manipulative and conniving. But totally. now that I watch it in, with different eyes, I see that she, probably she was a target for for an older man and a younger girl. Um, and there was a real power differential there. And that's actually not okay. Yeah. And I, I always knew that when I was playing it. I always I was knew. Ask. Yes. I knew. And it's so funny to me that when I read that in the New York Times, um, someone wrote on op ed, I thought, well, I always knew that. Yeah. How did you not see that? Right. Interesting. I mean, actors are the authorities on their characters. Like, of course, you knew this. Does it go back to you? in character are taking it seriously, whereas the audience are then bringing to it whatever they might bring to it, including they think she's hilarious. Yeah, and that's okay. It's Once sure. it leaves, once it leaves and is out in the world, it doesn't belong to me anymore. It belongs to people and audiences, and I can, I'm very good now at going, now it's theirs, and I love their reactions. Right, okay. But you were it's, not always good at that process of... Releasing yeah. that. Yeah. No, I used to mourn it. The day the movie came out, I'd cry. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't ours anymore. And I do mean not just me. I mean the cast, the crew, the yeah. director, and the writer. And I will say these characters belong to that whole team. Mm -hmm. I, I do think there's this intimacy that happens on movie sets that is wild. I mean, within a week, you've told every single dark secret <laughs> that pertains to the character to the people around you, because you're almost like saying, hey, I want to warn you, um, I might lose it <laughs> in this scene. And I need to, and sometimes you're so vulnerable. And in the scene, you say, I also need to tell you that this happened to my family, or this happened to one of my children, or, and yeah. you share these things and people hold your heart in their hands. And it's, it's actually really tender and beautiful. Yeah. It's hard to leave these experiences because you, you do feel like you're leaving your family a little bit. But at the same time, you are maybe cathartically working through stuff by playing these roles. Yeah, you if are, but I don't, I don't know that. if it's healthy, Boundary, Jack. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. If it's but that's the thing, like actors. Super healthy. <laughs> right. Like you, you, through trial and error and through a lot of experience, you've, how, you've taught yourself. You've figured out how to release characters and how to move on healthily or have boundaries or... Yeah, and yeah. some are harder than others, and it mm -hmm. helps that I have a wonderful husband and partner who goes, I think you need to, like, wash off the day, go yeah. take some time for yourself. If you need time after your movies, like, go and and really, um, really find, find something. But I, I will say it helps. Two things that really help, having friends that are not in the movie business okay. really is important. It's just so important for your – for your own mental health and safety, to be able to go into friendships that have nothing to do with work, with acting, um, you need to have healthy, productive conversations. Yeah. Um, yeah. And realize there's a world outside of it because it's very immersive. And also, um, I find, and this is just my personal experience, having a family, children mm. are a great equalizer. Mm. They don't care if you your movie flopped that weekend or you won an Oscar. They don't care. And <laughs> there's just this idea that all you are is who you are in that very present moment. And that has mm. really substantially um, provided stability for me. Yeah. And I, I was absolutely going to ask like about work, life balance and self-care. And it sounds like that's also a lesson that you've had to learn and that actors need to learn. Yeah. And it's, it's great that my children are, you know, my two oldest children are definitely artists and are on that artist journey. And, um, it's been lovely to, to watch them, um, step into acting and painting and music and just to reflect back the values that, uh, myself and their father 
you know, really carried through our professional careers. And just professionalism is a huge piece. You know, the respect of others and the respect for other people um, in the space and and really um, caring for your, your fellow performers, but also your cast and crew is a huge part of being an artist because this is a collaborative medium. I mean, if you want to be alone, go be a painter, <laughs> you know, yeah. or, or write a novel. But right. this is, you got to show up and be there for people in our business. For your awards consideration, Hacks, the Max original nominated for two SAG awards, including Outstanding Performance by an Ensemble in a Comedy Series. Starring Gene Smart, Hacks explores a dark mentorship that forms between a Las Vegas comedian and an entitled outcast 25-year-old writer. Praised for its, quote, whip-smart hilarious cast, don't miss what critics call comedy gold and this year's most perfect piece of television. Hacks is now streaming on HBO Max. I got to ask you about Bradley Jackson, but first, going off of this, I just spoke with Melanie Linsky as well, and I also, oh, I love well, of course you I know, just, actually. <laughs> I just loved her in Yellow Jackets. Yes, same. Oh, yeah. And I just, I just adored working with her on Sweet Home Alabama, <laughs> and it's been wonderful to see her in Don't Look Up, and her what a career moment. is just mm-hmm. really, um, and she's always been so insanely talented. Even Heavenly Creatures was something I watched okay. so uh, so many times as a young actor. It's cool. such a great movie for young actors to see those two female performances and Peter so Jackson's true. imagination of these two girls' memories. So true. It's, yeah. Well, the thing, I mean, it's funny, you mentioned this thing about audiences are now reassessing female stories and seeing them in a new light because actually her breastfeeding a baby in a bar in Sweet Home Alabama is having a similar moment of like, oh, this is actually very, very symbolic about a lifestyle or about women having it all. And of course, in the moment, it's entertainment. It's just silly. It's fun. So can I ask, where does your femininity play into your building of these characters? Of course, you've already touched on this, but some of them are real and some of them are fictional and some you're bringing yourself to. And I love the idea that you're watching people in shoe stores and at sororities. But like, how much of you are you consciously thinking this is a woman? Oh, I mean, everything. Women walk through the world in a different way. Yeah. And so did our mothers and so did our grandmothers and every woman that came before them. And it informs everything. I mean, does she live in a, uh, is she a, a coastal person? So she has different ideas. Is she a feminist? Is she submissive or dominant? Um, what are her what's her ideology around it does she feel like she got dealt a rough hand in life or mm. is she proud of the fact that she's accomplished so much there's just so much, many parts of walking through the world as a woman that are fascinating to explore and that's part of why i started in my company yeah you know 10 years ago i was reading parts that were so reductive mm. and so one dimensional And women are just a rainbow of feelings and experiences and emotions, and all of them are valid. But we are doing a disservice to audiences if you're only seeing one color. Yeah. And it's a wonderful honor to have a company where I can help promote um, female writers and and, um, give opportunities to female filmmakers and show up and work alongside of them. And it's it's really been exciting just in the past five years. And also with the emergence of streaming and the ability to tell longer yes. form stories, cool. it's really helped, I think. For sure. Um, yeah, tell more immersive and detailed stories about women's lives. Yeah, TV is 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 good for that, I think, especially these days. And that's a perfect segue to the morning show because – I'd love to just ask you, who is Bradley Jackson? We learned a lot about her in season two, like her circumstances and like speaking of backstory, like you, but this is also interesting, the long form TV idea, because in season one, we didn't know a lot of the stuff that we knew in season two. And I'm guessing you didn't either. (laughs) So do you invent backstory that is then contradicted with multiple seasons of a show? Well, I have to say, Carrie Aaron built beautiful character Bibles for us before we started in season one. So we knew so, so much. Um, 
Some things were new in season two. They were explorations of sexuality, um, of more of a backstory about myself and my brother. But we had, she and I had sat for hours and hours talking about Bradley's backstory. And she is from the Rust Belt. She is from West Virginia. There's just a way you walk into New York City that feels completely (laughs) different when you've been surrounded by, you know, you just grew up in the middle of the country. It's just from value systems. There's different thoughts about uh, spirituality and faith. Um, There's different thoughts about materialism, uh, about fame, things you don't understand, things you do. So I think Mm. she's a great foil to Jennifer Aniston's character, Alex Levy, because she's seeing it all like almost like the Wizard of Oz. We have this one scene, I think, in episode two or three of season one where she walks into the the television set and it's like Dorothy in Wizard of Oz. Oh, cool. Yeah. And she gets to be that that eyes for the audience, like, wow, this is really mm. exciting and magical. That is true. Yeah. She's both an outsider, but, <laughs> but she's also an audience surrogate for us. Yeah. And yeah. also really questions everyone's values inside that structure and is determined yeah. to get to the bottom of it. She's a funny character to play. And I have to say, she it's sometimes tough because she's really hard on people and she's hard on mm. herself. And mm. Mm. yeah, she's got a chip on her shoulder all the time. Which is not me at all. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I'm like joking around all the time. But yeah. it's fun to play. And Carrie Aaron is just extraordinary writer. It's amazing. Oh, yeah. You have those lovely, like, long, angry speeches. It's just so fun. Yeah. And yeah, I imagine <laughs> that that you and Jen on camera and then the and then they yell cut and you guys are completely different off camera. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> she and I are laughing. We were like... Um, whispering to each other yeah. and everybody can hear us. We're on a microphone, <laughs> but um, we've known each other for so long. It's just, it's so funny to just be with my friend who, um, and I just love her work on the show too. I think she's really expressing a side of herself that I think is very real and very vulnerable and yeah. And emotionally raw, just the, the knowing your place in the world and the ferocity with which you defend it. It's just delicious. Yeah. It's just delicious. And it's great to see a woman doing that. Exactly. So awesome. Totally. Um, Reese, thank you so much. I have to let you go soon, but we also, we have, as you know, these silly actorly questions that Backstage definitely wants from you. I haven't asked you about auditions at all. Okay. Have you done them recently? What was your attitude about them before? Do you love them? Do you hate them? I find them terrifying. Okay. (laughs) Um, I would always get really, really, really nervous. But again, it's just... To my best advice I give to people, I I have auditioned so much in my life. Okay. First of all, ego is the death of creativity. Mm. So check your ego. Even if you're an established actor, go do the thing. Go do the audition and have fun. Gotcha. You're never going to lose anything by trying. So dare greatly, get in there, have fun, enjoy yourself. I would come in, if I really didn't feel something, I would just do a weird take on it and just go, here's a weird take. <laughs> And I wouldn't tell anybody what I was doing. Have a, have a little secret inside of yourself too, by the way. That's always fun because I'm like so much about that audition process is just being brave and also confident. Just say, give me the ball. That What I think in my head is give me the job. I will handle it and I will figure it out later. Love it. It's it's almost the confidence of an athlete going, just throw the ball to me. Throw the ball to me. I'm, I've got it. I've got it. Because most directors and producers – just need you to be competent, confident, and professional. Yeah. Well, and is it almost like playing a role? Like if you're nervous, can you just play the role of a confident, competent person? Yes. The other little tidbit I like to share with people is think of what everybody else would do and do something slightly different. Mm. To be a little contrary. Yeah. Cool. That's great advice. Why not? Why not? Why not? I love the idea of like, if it's not quite clicking or the material's not quite working, just do the weirdest take. Just, just do something weird. It. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Show range. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I did this one audition where I was like, just spoke really slowly. Right. And I thought it was really good to speak slowly. And the director, I remember him stopping me and going, are you stoned? <laughs> I was like, no. And he was like, I'm making it why sense. are you talking like that? And I was like, 
that's just what I think she talks like. <laughs> he was like, all right, well, she doesn't. Goodbye. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. I mean, I was going to ask for worst audition horror story. Is it is it that one? That was probably it. I mean, because <laughs> you some. did not book that. I like to say what Martha Stewart says, which is I have a very short memory for very painful things. Oh, so I great. don't remember a lot of bad auditions. Hey, that's great. But I do remember being scared out of my mind all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I I do also have another. Don't wear a silk blouse. <laughs> Oh, because you will be sweating. Oh, and sweat. You'll be sweating. Oh. oh, okay. Yeah. And I also say actor neutral is a denim shirt. That's just actor oh, okay. neutral. Yeah. It's so funny. We went to the first reading of Morning Show. Every actor had on a denim shirt. <laughs> they all got the memo. It's like, we're all wearing actor neutral. This is so <laughs> weird. You can be anything. You could be a cowboy. Oh, you could be a Ralph Lauren model. You could be I, anything. Oh, how funny. Um, if you could go back and give yourself your early career self advice, I mean, that early career auditioning nervous self like what do you wish you'd known just don't worry so much don't worry so much Mm -hmm. and don't pay attention to what other people are thinking of you i know it's so hard right but the minute you let go of most of the world isn't thinking about you you're free and try to be free. Cherry Jones said this beautiful quote about pretending you're a child running in a field. And I think about that so much. Acting is about extreme focus and the ability to be playful and childish again. Yeah, getting to the essence of who you are or your original impulses or passions. Yeah. Yeah. This is all so, this is actionable, inspiring, informative, insightful so. advice, Reese. Thank you. I can't I love enough. actors so much. And, yeah. you know, I will say it's a great time to be a creator. It, this is, okay. I mean, to think about how democratized opportunities are, the ability to audition from anywhere is actually a gift. Yeah. So get out there. Also, write your own material. Get on YouTube. Self-publish. Don't be afraid. Um, there's so much out there for you, so just go grab it. Oh, thank you so much, Reese. I, I always ask for parting words of wisdom, and you just hit the nail on the head. That's so perfect. Thank you. And of course, start your own production company if you're not seeing the stories <laughs> or the roles that you right. Like just <laughs> that that'll be a whole other podcast. <laughs> yeah, totally. In the Envelope is recorded at Lotus Productions and Hyperbolic Audio in New York City and Soundbox LA, Mark Rouse Studios, and Buzzies in Los Angeles. Thanks as always to our producer extraordinaire, Jamie Muffet, and to the team at Backstage, Samantha Sherlock, Mark Stinson, Caitlin Watkins, and of course, Casey Howe. Visit Backstage.com, and don't forget, you can subscribe to Backstage by using the code ENVELOPE at checkout for a free trial. That's right, 100% free. For more exclusive content, join us on Facebook and Twitter at In The Envelope, and subscribe, share, and leave a comment. Who would you like us to interview next? Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time for another glimpse in the envelope.